Hi, my name is Tony O'Driscoll. Today I'd like to talk to you about learning in three dimensions. I'm going to cover seven sensibilities of virtual social worlds and explain to you the freedom that they provide for learning. But first, a clip from one of my favorite movies. Like Morpheus who got Neo to take the red pill about the Matrix, my goal today is to get you to take the red pill around virtual social worlds because in a way, virtual social worlds are very like the Matrix. Today what I'd like to talk to you about are the seven sensibilities of virtual social worlds. The first differentiating sensibility of virtual social worlds is the sense of self and the fact that you become your avatar over time, you associate with it, you feel that you are your avatar, and that's a very important differentiator between any other products such as Centra or any other 2D um, collaborative medium. So the sense of self and the feeling that you are your avatar is absolutely critical in these spaces. Just to give you a little sense of what I'm talking about, this picture here represents on the left Tony O'Driscoll and on the right my alter ego, what a trip in Second Life. I've been in Second Life uh, I guess close to nine months now which is an eternity in, in Second Life years. And up in the top left there is a colleague of mine, Chris Davis and I, and we're actually building out a learning strategy environment within Second Life. So the more you spend time in here, the more you really do get the sense of self. The next sensibility is the death of distance. The fact is, wherever you are within the virtual world, every other spot is no more than a millisecond away. So while you can drive a Scion in Second Life, you absolutely have no need for it whatsoever. Uh, the notion here is that we teleport and we go from place to place, but rather than me talk about it, maybe better for me to show you. I'm doing some work tonight on an event we're planning on Friday, so maybe I'll show you where I'm going and what I'm doing, and in that way you'll see how you teleport around. So here's my avatar waving. I'm just outside the Jacob Theater, which is where we're having the event, and as you'll see, I'm actually in midair. I'm now flying over to look at one of the gathering points we're going to have after the session, so I'm up in the air. Now I've decided I'm going to go somewhere else. I open the IBM's map and that red circle is me. As I move along I know I want to go to the intersection down there where I put my red dot. I hit teleport and boom, in very short order, I'm here and now you see this new space rendering out. No cars, no planes, nothing. There's the Sears, looking at the Sears and cutting across to Circuit City, which are two builds we've made, and then over to our interactive map. So as I walk over here to the interactive map, I know I want the next place I want to check out is Lotosphere. So rather than going to the map in, in 2D, I can click on it in 3D. It renders out for me, teleports me there directly. And here in a minute, I land in front of Lotosphere as it builds out. I think that gets across the depth of distance pretty well. Uh, now I'd like to talk to you about the power of presence. The power of presence really conveys the fact that inside of virtual social worlds, because you have a sense of self and because there is a depth of distance, you have the opportunity to convene, irrespective of where you are geographically, to share in an experience and an event. The event I'd like to show you is uh, a U2 concert in Second Life, and the avatars in the background are actually experiencing something that they could not experience elsewhere. <laughs> How's that for the power of presence? Now I'd like to talk about the sense of space and it's also the sense of perception. Uh, large things, small things, you can change your size, you can change the size of the objects you're looking at. And none other than Joe Miller uh, is going to share with us a clip from his magical molecule maker here and he's interacting with caffeine. Take a look and see what you think. Let's make another selection. And in this case, let's pick something O. Oh, uh, perhaps after the caffeine we're going to need a little aspirin. Let's take a look at, at aspirin. This one will have a little more structure to it and you can see it's, uh, it's a little more complex, a little more interesting. And If I were an organic chemistry student I could tell you exactly what the colors represent. I'm sure some of you can and uh, if you can feel free to uh, shout it out in the window. But uh, I wanted to give you a, a simple example of how flexible the scripting language is. 
and indeed how powerful it can it can be. This object can be used in a number of different ways. Uh, it can be scripted so that all I have to do is speak the compound that I would like to see rendered in three dimensions and indeed it has the ability to parse my chat text, find that in the database and present the uh, the three-dimensional object to me. You'll notice that this uh, this molecule that's been created is fairly sizable. I have the ability to scale that to some other size if I choose. But in this case, it's uh, it's big enough that I can actually use it as a seat. So I'll, I'll bring my avatar up and, and just have a seat right on it. And you can see it uh, supports my weight just fine. <laughs> Joe Miller having a bit of fun with an aspirin molecule there. The next sensibility I'd like to talk about is the capability to co-create. As we move from Web 2.0 into Web 3D, I think this is one of the more important sensibilities. Jimmy Wales from Wikipedia has spoken uh, a lot about creative co-production. I believe the 3D Internet takes this to the next level. Listen to how Jimmy describes creative co-production as we watch architecture students inside of Second Life building The chief out characteristics house. of uh, collaborative peer production that I see are the following. It's an abandonment of the gateway model um, in exchange for a model of uh, reputation and accountability. So people who are interacting together, if they have a means of identifying each other's reputation and being held accountable, um, then that works uh, to further very diverse production. Um, in a way that uh, scales much better than the gateway model of vetting everyone beforehand. Powerful stuff, the capability to co-create in 3D. Now the next sensibility is the pervasiveness of practice. And I've read Jay Cross's book and I think I'm going to ad lib here a little bit and say avatars are free range learners and virtual social worlds are the learn learnscape within which they live. Wherever you go in virtual social worlds, the most commonly uttered words uh, via chat or VoIP, depending on your platform, are, how do I? The picture to the left here is a picture of me inside Ivory Tower Prim Center in Second Life. And the training there is free. And you'll also notice as you go around inside of Second Life in the sandbox areas, a number of people engaging in peer-to-peer -peer learning around how to work with Prims. So again, the pervasiveness of practice is baked in to the culture and the environment, and it makes for a really rich learning experience. Speaking of experience, the final sensibility is the enrichment of experience. And I'd like to share with you a video from a friend of mine, Chris Davis's Agora Ballroom inside of Second Life, where a colleague and I are engaged in a ballroom dance. Here we are, Ginger and I, dancing away in the Agora Ballroom. Now you may ask, what's so good about that? Well, for Ginger and I, it's not such a big deal, but Chris told me about a husband and wife, and the wife had been uh, bound to a wheelchair for 20 years, and they come to the Agora Ballroom to dance, and that truly is an augmentation of experience. Uh, another story is about Iraqi soldiers who, uh, instead of just having a phone call, will choose to meet and actually have a dance with their loved ones across the oceans inside the Agora Ballroom. So Chris truly is providing augmented experience for his clients in Agora Ballroom. So at the end of the day, I believe these seven sensibilities offer us new freedom in learning, freedom to go into new and uncharted territories. First, flow. Balancing challenge and boredom in such a way that people feel completely engaged. Second, repetition. Providing avatars with the opportunity to try, try, try again. Third, experimentation. Allowing avatars to go where they want to go and experience for themselves what, what it is they want to do. Next is engagement. Uh, I think it's pretty clear from looking at this particular video that these environments are incredibly engaging. Next is doing. Uh, this is truly work-based learning in the classic sense in that the key question, how do I, either comes from doing or the next one, which is observing. And finally, as you wrap all of these threads together of freedom, you end up with motivation. Because within these environments, what you can do is engineer teachable moments at every turn and ensure that through flow and repetition, experimentation, engagement, doing and observing, that you have a highly motivated uh, individual who's engaged in learning and essentially they're learning while they're not looking. So have you fallen down the rabbit hole? And I hope that the last 10 minutes have convinced you, just like Neo, to take the red pill and boldly go where no one has gone before in the realm of 3D learning. Thanks for listening. It's 2 a.m. I'm going to bed.